Welcome back, everybody, to Kevin Pollack's Chat Show. I am, as always, Chat Show. I've missed you. You don't write. You don't call. I'm going to ask it. What the fuck is your problem? I will wait for an answer. We're coming to you live today, and by live, I mean I'm breathing, uh, from the Earwolf Studios, uh, located on Sunset Boulevard. That's all I'm going to say. You need to find out the rest for yourself. We're on the fourth floor. I'll give you that much more in uh, Studio A. All right, I'm done. I'm not going to get more specific than that. Uh, Cody, the engineer to the stars, is with us today, um, as he is on all the Earwolf shows. Not all. Uh, what would you say the percentage is, Cody? Half and half. Feels like half and half. I also felt a little bit of a meza meza uh, gesture, but we'll get into that later. Jamie and Sam are not here. They refused. Uh, I invited them. And, uh, well, I think the phrase was go fuck yourself. I think. Uh, I'm going to have to uh, check the memory banks. Sam is off at Comic Con because, as a lot of you know who uh, listen or watch this show, he is in desperate need of attention. On a moment by moment basis, so Sam Levine uh, is uh, is in San Diego, uh, along with 1.2 million people, uh, six of which are right now asking their friend, "That guy, who's that guy?" Um, he's there with his brother Max, who I adore, uh, and uh, Jamie uh, just really kind of waved me off when I said. <laughs> That, that's all she needed to wave me off. No, never, never you mind what she's up to. In fact, that's how I feel. Uh, my guest today is someone who uh, I've, I've asked a couple times to be on the show. And again, the similar wave off that I got from Jamie. But uh, we tracked him down. We put, uh, we put some sort of tag on his ear. And uh, Park Rangers found him in the hills uh, just above the Getty Museum. And they brought him to us. And so we're very excited. Uh, let me tell you about some upcoming shows and some previous shows and remind you that you can write to us. Oh, yes, you can. We would love to hear from you. No, no, not you, him. Uh, write to us at kpcsfanmail at gmail.com. That's KPCS, as in Kevin Pollack's chat show. Uh, another reminder, always put your name in the title of the show. That way you can't be replaced. Uh, didn't they replace Rhoda? I think I asked this once before. I think I think uh, Valerie Harper was on a show with the name Rhoda in it, and they, they found someone else to do the show. Uh, I think it was called Valerie, actually. <laughs> Somebody looked that up, Cody. Uh, KPCSFanMail at gmail.com. Write to us. Tell us what you think of anything. Uh, I don't have any emails to write to you today because J-Mac, our wonderful research producer, had nothing to do with today's show uh, for the simple reason that I just didn't feel like paying him. Uh, and then he checked out. Emotionally and uh, physically. Recent shows you might enjoy on Earwolf, or if you go to KevinPollock.tv, all the uh, videos there waiting for you. Christopher Guest, Lauren Graham, Billy Bob Thornton, Rob Riggle, J.K. Simmons, Craig Ferguson, Michaela Watkins. Uh, that's the only way I can pronounce her name. And so many more waiting for you. Uh, right damn there. Upcoming guest, Brian Cranston, the wonderful Martha Kelly, who I enjoy so much on the Galifianakis program, Baskets. Mr. Paul Rudd, Bob Saget, and uh, the end of October, day before my birthday, yeah, Ricky Gervais. Pretty damn excited about that. Subscribe to us on YouTube, blah, blah, blah. All right, let's get to, uh, to the show. How about that? Um, also, we are, our very own uh, uh, post-production engineer, Corey Levin, created a visual graphic and soundbite last night. Uh, on our last show, you may remember, we uh, were trading stories about Richard Kind. Jeff Garland was on. There's another recent show for you to check out. And Jeff Garland um, had some Richard Kind stories. So we realized we needed to have a segment on the show. We're now fascinated, uh, uh, overly fascinated with all things Richard Kind. And uh, Kind Words was the first name of the segment. And then it grew to um, Close Encounters of the Richard Kind. And we now have a graphic that goes with it, and it is spectacular. So look for that um, ridiculously soon. Uh, maybe it – well, it will be on the next video show. That's right. This is an audio only. Go fuck yourself. Uh, my guest today asked that he not be uh, uh, videoed in any way, shape, or form. So I respect my guest's wishes, and so let's get to him now. 
Ladies and Jews, please welcome Ian Gomez. Ian. Hi, Kevin. Uh, uh, how are you? I'm well. Save I'm, it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's the problem with these things. You can start the conversations before you go uh, on the recording. Yeah. And, uh, and this is why Johnny Carson hid uh, backstage and never talked to anyone before the show. Oh. Because he was afraid it would be good stuff that he'd want. He'd have to say to their face, yeah. save it. Well, uh, the conversation we had before we started actually recording um, were, were not that great. They so, weren't. No, they there weren't. Was nothing so, to say. Nothing to say. You've um, come to us from uh, what part of uh, Los Angeles? Today? Uh, towards the, uh, in the Valley, uh, Studio City area. Uh-huh. Yeah. You know why they call it Studio City? Um, no. Me neither. No. Listen, um, uh, how's the family, first and foremost? Family's wonderful. Yes. Uh, family's fantastic. Uh, they're all growing. Uh, I just have one daughter, but my wife is growing, too. Sure. No. Um, oh, we're all growing. We're all growing. Yeah. Or we're, we're moving in direction. I think we're at the stage now where we're shrinking. I'm definitely shrinking. Yeah. I, yeah. Me, too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I'm enjoying it. I, you know, I was 5'8 and a quarter, and I don't think I'm 5'8 and a quarter anymore. Did you lose the quarter? I think I lost a quarter. Yeah, I refuse to measure myself at some point. I just said I'm not going to do it. Yeah. I also stopped uh, weighing myself. Oh, really? Yeah. I, I will on occasion uh, eat better mm-hmm. and continue to exercise, which I, I – for me, it's about uh, uh, cardio. So I'll, I'll either get on the elliptical right. for 45 minutes and sure. watch a television program, mm-hmm. which is the only way I can exercise. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, or I'll go outside. What? And I'll go – I know. It seems bizarre, and I'll go like on a uh, hour, forty-five to an hour. Very, I don't want to say power walk because it sounds pretentious. So it's a very <laughs> fast-paced walk, a brisk walk. Oh uh, yeah, yeah, like like I'm being chased. Wow, and do do people stop you? Because, it's a comical walk. Yes, it's so fast. <laughs> <laughs> People want to know what's the matter. Right. Are, it, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> yeah, which yeah. is all I play on, on my earbuds <laughs> <laughs> so that I can keep that pace. Uh, uh, not that recording of it. No, oh, no. No, not, no? not the not me doing recording. It? Nope. Okay. Uh, it's a band. There's an orchestra. <laughs> yeah, that I have in my head. First and foremost, I need you to share everything you can remember about your experience working on the television program Lost. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's not meant to elicit laughter, but you can start there. Okay, I did one episode of Lost. Yes, you did. Uh, I was in. Uh, I worked two days. They flew me down to Hawaii. Um, well, now when you say down, down, yeah. Well, it is south of here. Yes, it is. Right. It's the furthest. The, the, I remember uh, uh, a trip to the Big Island, and mm-hmm. there's a little restaurant on the far south. Uh, tip yeah. that claims to be the southernmost point of the United States wow. of America. Uh, that and more useless information in just a minute. Wow, that's that's. So you know so you get the call. I get the call. Um, and I'm your doing agent lost, says, and I say, uh, well, it was uh, you know, it's just at that, it's a series of auditions and everything like that, and with a bunch of people I don't know. And uh, I got the job. I was very excited because I got to go to Hawaii. I hadn't been to Hawaii, and uh, you had not been prior. I had not been prior to the to the state of Hawaii. Really, really, um, yeah. I'm from New York City. Sure, you know, we would. You know, that's very far away. Right, but you've been in the Cali Fornai way for quite some time. Uh, yeah. How many years? Yeah. What are we talking about? Oh my goodness. Uh, well, at that point, maybe I don't know, fourteen, fifteen. At that point, maybe. Sure. Okay. So, so again. It's not ridiculous of I me know. to think you might have found your way sure. to the island. Right. But it's, you know. Uh, yeah, I yeah. get it. You hadn't been to Catalina either. No. Right. Me, no. Ne- me neither. No. So, there haven't been any clear days. I can't find it. <laughs> <laughs> so you find yourself in Hawaii. And uh, any trepidation on your way over uh, on a plane? Because you're, nope. you're flying over water I'm and just o- water for six hours. Uh, well, thank, I didn't think of that. No uh, one told you. No one told me. Okay. Good thing I wasn't um, on the flight. I'd rather land in water than land on hard ground. Take it easy, Sully. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that son of a bitch ruined a great routine in my stand-up back, by the way. Oh, really? Yeah. Well, every comedian needs to let go of their, quote-unquote, flying material because yeah, okay. it becomes rather pedestrian. Um, but as Leno once pointed out, uh, you know, listen, it's okay to get on a McDonald's routine. Just make sure it's the funniest McDonald's routine. <laughs> uh, so, I, yeah, I had a bit about uh, the pre-flight uh, – a flight instruction that the flight attendant gives. I'm going to yeah. stop saying the word flight. And during the pre-flight speech, um, in case of a water landing. Yes. Uh, always annoyed the piss out of me. But, uh, 
so so what? The plane is going to nosedive straight down and then whoosh, go go <laughs> parallel, and uh, and it was it was so I had the whole thing about uh, what else are they going to tell me? The drink cart is a shark tank. <laughs> What am I supposed to cram lightly salted nuts into the shark's eye? Get out of here, you. Um, so I had, I had like a, a tight three minutes on the ridiculous nature that the, yeah. yeah. So <laughs> Sully, hero, live saved, and all I'm thinking is, well, there goes a great three minutes. Uh, yeah, well, see that? Know, in time, people will forget. And then they made that movie. <laughs> and then- More time. And people, yeah. So yeah. now you need a little bit more time and people- So you're excited going to Hawaii. I'm excited going to Hawaii because I'm working and also I'm, I'm, going, I'm going to Hawaii. And also I find out that I'm working the first day. So I get there at night and I have to work at like five in the morning. Always good. And then I have three days off. Oh no, until you work again. Until I work again. So you rent a car. So I rented a car. Sure. Um, I rented a Jeep. Oh. Never been in a Jeep before. And I'm like driving around the island, and you know it's uh, which it's, island? Uh, Oahu. Sure. And um, probably the mm, ugliest of the islands. Would you say? Let's just say yes. Okay. Um, but still very nice. And there's uh, parts of it. In fact, where the show was shot was a, was a part that was less. Uh, yeah, well, we actually shot in the prison, so it was really kind of nasty. Sure. Um, but I was staying in some hotel, and there's uh, you know you could walk to uh, bars. <laughs> Which was great. Better believe it. And I did that, and I met some military guys, mm -hmm. and uh, there was a Led Zeppelin cover band, and I got invited to a barbecue. So I got in my, my Jeep a uh, day later, and I went to this barbecue with a bunch of strangers, and it was really awkward. <laughs> and did the, I didn't enjoy myself. Did the barbecue involve <laughs> burying a pig? Because that's very big on the island. No, no. It was um, – uh, they had been there for a while, but they hadn't really gone native um, sure. So it was like, you know, hot dogs and frankfurters. And, and these were locals? The, no, these were people uh, people in the military, uh, you know, who were kind of living there and stuff. Uh, are, were they still in the military, uh, military but Man, living off base? That's a lot of questions, Kevin. I really don't know <laughs> I much may not about have, them. I it may was not a long have, time ago. I may not have prepped you on how the <sighs> show works. Okay. So mm -hmm. I think they were still in the military. No, that's incorrect. That's not, <laughs> not, <laughs> that's not what you have there. That's it's right. not, no. So you went to the barbecue. It was went to awkward. The barbecue. It was awkward and it was like weird and everything. And then I, you know, I drove back. And, um, but the thing is, I, I was f five shades darker between the day I started work sure. and the, the next day was three days later. And uh, it was all continuous and interwoven. So like in some scenes, I'm pale and then dark, pale, dark, pale, dark. If I can, and, I'm going to suggest, uh, and please forgive me for the terminology, your people mm -hmm. are tan easily. Yes, okay. yes, we do. Um, yeah, we do. And especially since I'm bald, it doesn't. it's hard to kind of hide. It's everywhere. It's everywhere. Meanwhile, the makeup department should have noticed a difference. They don't care. They don't care. They don't care. It they, was like season 12. They drove like, past uh, caring. You yeah. know, they're like, let's just get him to be not shiny, and then uh, That's right. we'll go have lunch. But see, now I was one of those um, – Truly devoted fans. Oh, were you? Even through the so-called lean years when the show allegedly went askew. I, I disagreed and loved every episode, and I remember your episode. Oh, really? I do, and I don't remember the tan coming and going. I don't, you know, I, so I, I don't. So let it go. I don't, okay, I'm, it's gone. Um, I watched the first few episodes lost, and then- You were went, lost. I was lost. And then once they got rid of the thing that was shaking in the jungle- you know, we're like the first few, like, oh, we can't go in the jungle because this thing is shaking. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, they're living in the jungle, and the thing that shakes disappeared, and no one's worried about you it. You know what? It, too, gets a vacation. <sighs> yeah. So I was just like, oh, is this what it's going to be like? And I'm just going to have anxiety? I have enough anxiety. I don't want to- You don't need programs. Watch. I don't, yeah. Why watch? Like, uh, Breaking Bad. I couldn't watch it. Gave you anxiety. So much anxiety. I see. I was just like, uh, there are people going to find out and, yeah. you know, all this other stuff. And I was, just, I, I don't need this. That's just, it's not relaxing or enjoyable to me. Getting anxiety from fiction is uh, <laughs> something you should talk to somebody about. You should lie down and have a conversation. Well, I get involved, you know. Yes, I, you do. You know, I get very involved. And right. that's, that's the point of the whole thing. They want you to be, you know, invested in their show. Yes. And I get invested. And then I'm like, ah, I can't deal with all the stress. Right. And then. Are you familiar with the mute button? <laughs> then what's the point? That's why. That's how I watch sports, though. In it a is. bar, yeah, I without just, intensity. Yeah, because are you emotionally involved in sports? No, not really. No. And that's why I can watch it. Yes, because I don't really care. <laughs> care. Well, care. so what are you watching these days? These days, I started watching. Um, I think on your recommendation, the Patriot. And how many episodes in are you? I am three. 
two and a half, two and a quarter episodes in. <laughs> Wow. Yeah. So you really committed. You bailed. Uh, <laughs> no, no. 15 it's just, minutes into the third episode. Well, I had I had things to do. Sure, I understand. I, you know. Um, um, will you continue to watch I it? think I will because, you know, it is- It's not intense. At, it's not intense. And, you know, it's intense situations, but the guy doesn't get all stressed out about it. It's purposely slow and um, diabolically well-written. It's fantastic. Yeah. I'm really enjoying it. Yeah, The Patriot. Yeah, The Patriot. I think it's just- pa- On Patriot. Amazon. Yeah. That's, is that, can we do that? Sure. No? Okay, great. Yeah. I'll, I'll send that that little soundbite to him great. and see if I can get some. Maybe I'll some get Prime for a year. For sponsorship. Free. That'd be great. Yeah, I uh, uh, yeah, I can't get enough. Okay. Yeah. Um, but I'm glad you, you you tested the waters. Yes, I did. And uh, on your recommendation. Sure. Yeah, because, you know, I stopped. I got out of the habit. I'm, I'm one of these people who, like, gets into a habit, and then I'm like, I got to do this every day, like archery. Like, I'm going to be an archer, and I get all the equipment and everything like that. And then, like, one day I miss it. Like, I don't do it, and then I forget the entire thing. It's not archery. My father did that. But I'm like my father where I get obsessed with something. Sure. And then— You're all in. My, all in. Yeah. And then I miss a day or two, and then I get out of the habit, and then I don't do it again. You so. you lose that love and feeling pretty fast. Yeah. This is remarkable because you've been married like 23 years. Yeah. Yeah. So, Huh. Um, so so you're all in you're all out well I noticed that at the poker table uh, in Kansas City I can't yeah yeah uh, I'm a horrible poker player. No, that's And that's not why true. you kept inviting me to sit down, <laughs> which is weird. I'm not good. Why is he inviting me to I don't, play? I would not say that you're a horrible poker player in any way, shape, or form. I think you understand the game yeah, better than most. I, I, okay, but uh-huh. you, know, you see a sucker come and you're like, have a seat. <laughs> uh, it's a full table, but we can build a chair for you. Now, uh, was your father on the Russian Jew side? No, my your father's mo- from Puerto Rico. And your mother was on the my Russian Jew. My mother's, Jews. yes. My mother's family's from Russia. Because I see you're actually, from that combo. Yes. Flatter. Actually, I've just found out that um, uh, Wait for it's it. actually Ukrainian. Sure. Odessa. How did is, you find that out? Well, I was, I was talking to some Russians, mm-hmm. and I said that, you know, my grandmother was from uh, Odessa. They're like, no, that's the Ukraine. But it's... It's all the same. Was it the Ukraine when your grandmother lived probably there is not. the I don't question. Know. No, probably not. Might have been but, part of Prussia. Ooh. You know, there's various incarnations. All right. I went to high school. My, uh, I barely, uh, <laughs> my grandfather was from Minsk. Minsk. Yeah, which was part of <laughs> Prussia. <laughs> which is why you got into comedy. That's right. Yeah, well, Minsk. I got into comedy because he and his uh, brother would sit on opposite ends of the family table for – uh, the various gatherings and yell at each other in a way that was fucking hilarious uh, <laughs> because there was an intensity that you really thought they were going to kill each other. And I would ask my mother because they would speak in Yiddish or whatever, and I asked my mother, what are they yelling about? And she would say, the food. <laughs> what, yeah, it was never anything important. It could have been the traffic. I, my, I uh, spent time with my grandma and my great aunt in uh, uh, Florida, and they would – horrible cooks, by the way. And they would sit on either side of me while they I ate, yeah. and they would comment. and How and you were me, eating? Yes, and give me coaching. Wow. And yell at me for, you know, uh, smacking my lips or the fork hitting my, my teeth or the fact that I'm eating too much meat and not mixing it up with the rice or the vegetables. Like I'm not equally – eating it all. I'm eating all of one and, and not the other, and it drove them crazy. Ian, I'm going to ask you to try to find a connection between <laughs> that time of your life and your inability to stay focused and connected on archery. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Let it go. It's okay. You can eat I, I hate my grandmother. Well, she was a hateful woman. She was. She loved you in her own way. A hard, hard way. Right. Which is why when you play craps in Vegas, you always bet the hard way, don't you? I do. Right. And how often does that come in? Never. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Laugh through the tears. Uh-huh. Let's go back to young Ian Gomez. Okay. Your father was an artist. Yeah. Well, yeah. 
What does that mean? Well, no, he was he he took art classes and he was art, and then he's like, well, like the archery. I, yeah. And then what can I do that kind of involves art, and then you make money, and he got into advertising, and so it was back in the day where you know they freehanded. There's a penis drawn on this table where they freehanded, um, and it was freehanded. It was freehanded. Look yeah. at that. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, like they. You know, for for uh, for magazines, you know, so layouts, draw layouts that's sure. Right. Yeah, I, I, took I watch Mad Men. <laughs> I didn't. Nope, too uh, intense. No, nope, there was too intense. Yeah, the Secret Life. I couldn't. Do My it. father sold yeah. kitchens, designed and sold kitchens for Sears uh, for thirty years, and he too would be at a drastic table at mm -hmm. night, and he would draw. Oh. These, like, kitchens of the future. He would go into people's homes, look what they have, how horrible it is, and he would come home and he would uh, – until 2, 3 in the morning, he would always bust you when you came home from w being with your friends. Dad was always there at the drafting table. And he would draw these kitchens of the future with the sparkling floors and the things, oh. right? So I think it might have been similar in so terms he, of these he layouts. Drew, he, he drew the sparkle? He drew the sparkle. Yeah. He drew the whole thing. And then he would take it back to them in their home and then sell them the appliances necessary ah. to have this kitchen of the future. Wow. See how shiny new it is yeah. by this, this drawn sparkle? Yeah. But That's it was based on some sort of artistic eye, which uh, it con conjured up when you were saying your dad did these layouts yeah. for ads yeah. for ads yeah. and things. For, yeah. Like mostly industrial magazines. Right. Like I always wanted to see his work and it would be in like in something that's like, you know, Tool and die, and sure. just like, but that sparkle off the hammer. Yeah, <laughs> was, I, yeah. He never. I don't think he did sparkle. He wasn't. Very, no, he was. He was very good at it, but uh, he kept hating working for a company for an ad agency. And then he would go, okay, I'm just doing freelance, and then would hate the clients, talking to the clients, and then we'd go back to a, uh, an agency, uh -huh. and so it was like back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, and all of a sudden, oh. computers came along. And all of a sudden, he's obsolete. So we had to take some time off, take out a loan, and learn his craft on a computer. And then, which he uh, did, which he did. And then, you know, he he he, he died with no money. <laughs> Ian, do you see any sort of connection between that story and your inability to spend a dollar? Uh, I will. It's, if I spend it, it'll be gone. That's right. <laughs> I'll never uh, have it back again. Uh, did you get advice early on in your professional career from anyone who said, save your money? Um, uh, there was, it was a cliche that you hear. Yeah. Yeah. Save your money because, you know, and I was like. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm making it now. But I'm making it now and yeah. I'm never going to stop making it. So right. I'm going to spend it as much as I can. I mean, we never, we never did like crazy things. We'd go on vacations or anything like that, but we didn't buy, you know. Expensive cars or anything like that. We, we uh, maybe sometimes we're a little house poor, but um, sure. But you know, it's a phase. I don't. I don't really have any money saved, but you know, it's. Uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, I don't know how that happened. That's for suckers. It's the, it's the taxes. I don't that know. whole they take uh, half of what you make. I don't think people understand. You're only seeing forty cents on the dollar if you have an agent and a manager and a tax man. It's unbelievable. Forty cents on the dollar. And then when you know they say, "Well, he's making you know X amount of money." Uh, yeah. an episode that's uh, do yourself a favor never type this into a Google search Ian Gomez net worth because <laughs> it's a number it's a number that someone pointed out to me that uh, I think equals the amount that I earned in my lifetime earned <laughs> really yeah yeah earned which you never think of as a total number uh -huh. but in a lifetime you know in my case I'm old uh -huh. so uh, I've been at this almost 30 years wow. in terms of being in the motion pictures. Please be seated. Um, and that number as a total yeah. is it chokes a horse. But you don't see, you know what I mean? No. It's like I can't fathom. No. I would take 10% of it yeah. at this point. Yeah. It would be great. Oh my. Uh, what Crazy. catches uh, Ian Gomez's eye is, as a youngster? Mm -hmm. uh, who, In other words, who turns you on to maybe comedy in either film or on records or on television? Um. Uh, probably, um, you know, I was a fan of John Biner's when, uh, yes. yeah, and I would watch him and then I would imitate his imitations. That's right. And John Wayne, John Wayne, right. And, and, uh, do all that stuff. And I love that. Um, and so you I were young that. when that was happening. Yeah. I was like, yes. Um, and then George Carlin, then oh, I got, yeah. and I had all of his albums. Yeah. And, and that uh, is in what? Junior high, high school? That Junior high, probably. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty, pretty young. 
Um, and you and your friends are doing this, or this is something no, you found? Um, me and maybe one friend wasn't like, yeah, we're going to just go listen to comedy. I, it wasn't that cool. Sure. Um, I just don't want to picture you alone masturbating with George Carlin. <laughs> That's all. But somebody yeah, else. It's such a small ass. <laughs> um, very and, very you know, that thing hips. and uh, uh, the, with the f- occupation fool, he's got, you know, he's showing his midriff. Yep. He's wearing a vest with no shirt. For fuck's sake. Unbelievable. Um, so it was that. And my stepfather owned a uh, – he was in the restaurant business. And when uh, during the 60s, he owned a, a club in Manhattan in, the, in Greenwich Village. I don't know the name. Don't ask me. I keep forgetting it. And um, – Supper club? Uh, it was like a – you know, no, it wasn't supper club. Music? It was music and comedy and sure. stuff like that. So, you know, you get like, you know, whatever acts are in town and, mm-hmm. you know, they play there. Um, and Second City – uh, they had like a, a New York residency there, you know, for a short time with Alan Arkin yeah. and Bob Dishy and, uh, you know, Zorna Lampert. I have, I have this. Anyway, uh, so he knew about Second City from an early age. I mean, from a long time ago. Your early and age. from my, yes, from uh, from my early age, he had been telling me, you should go to Chicago and try this comedy thing. Because he saw you listening to comedy albums? Because he saw me listening and to comedy albums. And, and, yeah, and being a smart ass and... Uh, and everything. So, uh, and how old are you when he gives you that he's very from, important I mean, advice? He was. Uh, he came into my life when I was about eight or so, and seven or eight. So, whenever I would do something funny, uh, you know, kid funny, sure. Um, he would. Oh, you'd be great for Second City. They would. You know, you should do that. So it was like, which initially is a strange thing to say to a nine-year-old, right? Like, <laughs> move to Chicago. <laughs> It sounds like he was trying to get you out of the house. I think I think he just he just wanted that's he sent me to summer camp two months every summer. Sure. Just so he could have sex. Do things with my mom. That's right. Um so uh finally I just uh, I decided instead of going to the restaurant business, which was where I was headed, that uh I was gonna go to Chicago. I've been taking some acting classes in, in New York and I we were about to open up a restaurant in Connecticut together. And I freaked out and I said, I, I can't do this. I'm going to go to Chicago. Never been there before. Like you've been telling me to do. Yes. And so he couldn't be that angry with me. How old uh, were you? I was 20, 22, 23. Uh-huh. That's what I have, 22. Oh. <laughs> 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 You're going to catch me in more lies. Uh-huh. And then, um, yeah, and so I went. I'd never been there and, you know, uh, got into the – the training center. Did you know anyone there. in Chicago? I didn't know anyone. Oh, so, I knew I knew uh, the brother of a woman that I was taking classes with, uh, acting classes with, and uh, I she had a brother. She said, "Look him up when you get to Chicago." Basically, okay. You know, there's no. And, and what was he doing in Chicago? He was an actor. His name is um, uh, <laughs> John Carroll Lynch, who's uh, who's an actor. Uh, we know John. Yeah, Carroll you know, Lynch. He's yeah. been on this very show. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it was his uh, sister Nora. And I also lived with his Nora uh, Carol Lynch. N- Nora Lynch, sure. Just Nora were, Lynch. They all had the and then, name of Carol. <laughs> and then Dan Carol Lynch, uh-huh. the older brother. Um, and so I lived with the two brothers for for a while uh, separately and uh, together. And uh, that's none great. of our business. I'll be honest with you. Some of these <laughs> they're, things they're you very keep tall, inside. Very tall men. So so you knew that Second City was there from your stepfather. Yes. Uh, there's no internet back then, so there's no, no recon you can really no, do. You show up with a couple dollars in your pocket. Exactly. And John Carroll Lynch says, you can stay with us yes. uh, while you figure your shit out. Mm-hmm. And you you immediately apply for classes. Yeah, I'm getting for uh, classes. Is this Olympics, Improv oh, I did, Olympics? Yeah, I did that too, the Improv Olympics, the I.O. Mm-hmm. They got sued for saying Olympics. They can't do that. Um, so uh, the I.O., I—, I they would put you up on stage almost right away, uh-huh. basically. If you had, you know, money for classes, they would put you up on stage, and which was great because you failed tremendously. And uh, Did you have any improv training prior to that? I mean, in the acting classes I was doing, it was a lot of Sandy Meisner stuff. So, like, we get up and, you know, some tissue box, tissue box, tissue box. T- fuck you, fuck you. It always turned into fuck you. But um, we would basically kind of improvise scenes. But it wasn't comedic improv. Uh, that took uh, some getting used to and I actually failed my audition to get into the classes um, uh, but I was working there at the time they felt bad for me so they they let me in um, and then 
a year later, I auditioned for the tra- uh, touring company, and I got in. And uh, A year later? A year later. Uh, so are you doing anything as a day job? Well, I am. Uh, I work at Second City selling T-shirts sure. or, or uh, washing dishes. That's right. Uh, I worked my way up to bartender, and then I became an, an assistant manager, which was uh, – Administrative. Yes, administrative. I was I was the man. But all the while, you're trying to get on stage, taking exactly. classes, and you right. eventually audition for the touring company. Now, t- I don't know that folks know much about this touring company. Uh, we had um, Jordan Peele on. He was part of the, uh, I think, mm-hmm. Improv Olympics and talked about going to Amsterdam was a big uh, thing for their company. The, a we lot. went to Vienna. We, we got to go to Vienna. You're making that up. No, nope. we went. I went twice. What to Vienna. the fuck? Because my mind was blown when they decided Amsterdam was the place that I'd needed I'd rather improv. go to Amsterdam and than said, Vienna. You know, where was Hitler's complex? He was, <laughs> the home, home office was in Vienna, I think, right? Well, Let's, the thing started with, like, uh, Austrian Airlines was uh, doing a direct uh, flight from Chicago. And that's all it took. Chicago to Vienna. And that's and all so, it took. So we were part Couldn't of go that. to Italy. No, nope. seriously. Unbelievable. Vienna. I went to Vienna once uh, during the Christmas holiday season, and it was beautiful. Yeah, it's festive. Nice. But I was just walking around. Still, but there's still a lot of kind of like Nazi looking for schnitzel. Yes, my difficulty was the hard consonants uh, pronounced in a Germanic uh, accent mm. that did not go well. I in- instantly slipped into Woody Allen. <laughs> you know, I don't mean to sound didactic, but uh, I think I'm going to be waiting at the train station until it's time to go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, so you you audition. You're touring now. Other than yes. Vienna, where are you touring? Oh, we uh, we do a, a ski tour. So we went to like Crested Butte and Aspen, and, and these uh, are paid things. Paid, but they would pay us maybe sixty five dollars a show. And by us, you mean who's in the company? Well, I got hired. People we would know. Yes, I got hired with Stephen Colbert, correct, and <laughs> uh, Chris Farley. That's right, and uh, Amy Sedaris. Mm-hmm. And uh, Steve Carell was, uh, I think, hired a, a few months before I was. Um, and So no one we've heard of. No one you've heard of. Right. No. And, oh, some, and, and uh, Tina Fey was maybe six months behind me. Right? Behind you. Behind me. Yeah, let's make that just, clear. Uh, you know, just that's She's gathering hiring. crumbs. That's in hiring. <laughs> yeah. Um, she learned from me. That's right. Yeah. Watching me. Sometimes, according to legend, mm. uh, Mr. Chris Farley – uh, needed a, a stand-in, a replacement. Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, my research shows that that fell on you. Yes. I was Chris Farley's understudy, which uh, was probably the hardest job in the world. Because um, it just meant you worked all the time. No. <laughs> well, he broke his leg once, and then he went to – it was never because he was, like, you know, too drunk or, or full to perform. Um, uh, he broke his leg, and he, when he went to SNL, then I, I filled in for him and thought I was part of the company until they replaced me. Um, but, uh, you know, he's Chris Farley. You know, they, they write for him, basically, and, or they create for him, and then you try to just do a, an imitation of Chris Farley, and it's it, it, horrible. And then you have to learn, well, I got to do it this my way. Mm-hmm. And then it's like, well, it's not that funny because this is <laughs> so Chris. Written for him. Yeah, it's written for him. And it's, you know, so. Uh, You're there was, to learn how to trust your instincts. Yeah. Yeah. And I, uh, so yeah, I, it was a good learning experience. I got some laughs, uh, but there were a couple of scenes like the, you know, the the, the bit from SNL and uh, the motivational speaker in the sure. band down by the river. Sure. That, that guy. That was a Second City scene. And uh, written by Bob Odenkirk, who mm-hmm. was on the, uh, who was in the company at the time, also former guest. Uh, well, I hope you say that about me when someone mentions me. Yep. Okay. Um, and that I, I mean, I couldn't. I, there was no funny jacket or wig or anything that was going to make it funnier. And it's just you know pure Chris. Um, so, you know, it was a good learning experience. Uh, and the thing about – and failure, you know, and that was the thing about going to the I.O. and failing a lot, getting up on stage and, and failing. It's like you kind of – you don't – you lose the fear. Of yeah. It. You do it so much and you go, well – It doesn't hurt. I'm, I'm all right. Yeah. I'm, I'm surviving. So then when, you know, once you don't – you're afraid – once you're not afraid of failing, then like you can be creative and let you, all that stuff out. You can be free. You can be free. To uh – to say everything that comes to mind yeah. without editing. Right. Yeah. And how long were you on the tour, as it were? 
Um, I was at Second City for uh, for seven years, and I think I toured for maybe four or five. And when you we go out as a group of merry men and women, yes, you would go out of town for. What how, what sort of periods? Well, sometimes of time? you would it would be local, you know, uh, maybe an hour away or something like that, and mm-hmm. uh, you get into a van and you go. Uh, sometimes it was like two or three days, and you still get in a van. Rarely did they pay for flights, sure, us, unless we were going to like the east coast or the west coast. Yeah, even um, Vienna. Yeah, you, you know, we drove, we drove as far as we could mm-hmm. to Vienna, and so you spent a lot of time in a van. And back then, it was like okay to you know smoke indoors and sure. in cars. Better believe it. And you'd stop and you'd uh, you know get gas station food. It was it was uh, we're young, yeah, so young, yeah, yeah, so foolish, uh huh, and smelly apparently because you know you know you're in a van. Sure, it's horrible. It, well. Uh, I I like to romanticize mm-hmm. that um, uh, a traveling group of performers, <laughs> a band of married, <laughs> yeah, gentlemen, yeah, it, are are uh, w- without real responsibility other than to get on stage and play, yeah, that yeah. night, yeah. Um, there's going to be some hijinks and some tomfoolery. I mean, the, uh, that's the romantic view of I it. I don't see you guys and women just driving around bored all day long with nothing to do. Whatever. I mean, but, you know, it, was, it wasn't as, as funny as you might think it was. Maybe not on a daily basis. I mean, I'm sure there were funny things that went on. Uh, but I, you know, I, I wish I had something really interesting to say. I, I, I roomed with this guy named uh, Greg Holloman, and was, he's— uh, He's an actor. Mm-hmm. Do you have him on that list of paper there? Was no? he any offspring to Earl Holloman, the actor? No, no. He's a uh, six foot five, thin, bald headed black male. Um, so I don't think. No, no, no connection no, whatsoever no. to the short uh, white guy. <laughs> um, and we would always room together. And uh, we would just, I mean, this is not even funny. I don't know why I'm saying this. But we would get to a hotel if we're staying overnight. And then we would wrestle uh, in the room. Absolutely. Uh, Naked. To get – no, not – well, no. Not usually. See, I'm going for – To go – you're, you're trying no. to get me to open up, Kevin. Stop it. And <laughs> so we you would, guys would check in. We would check in and we'd get to the wrestle room, and we'd wrestle. Ready, single. go. Everybody want – we both wanted the window bed. Sure. Yeah, and, of course. In um, case there's a fire, you need to get out. Right. Or or just to have the window bed because you decided, the other person wanted the you window bed. You decided that was the bed. So that's, you know, that's that's what we would do. And then we would go and, and we had some, you know, it's, it's wacky people. We had this piano player named Charlie. And uh, every time we rolled into some town, he would like eyeball uh, where the nearest – Delhi was where he can get a six pack and a sandwich, mm-hmm. and he was, you know, that's all he did was drink, and he was eat know, sandwiches and eat sandwiches, and that's you know he would. Uh, I wish this was TV. Oh. <laughs> I have a physical imitation of, but you know he was like, you know, I'm just gonna you know go to the, uh, you know he 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 would make some sort of hip yes, gathering gesture. Right. He would hit hitch up his pants with his forearms, uh-huh. which is uh, probably very, the least. You know, effective way of hitching up your pants. It is the least. And, uh, you know, he would just like, he was, I guess he was an alcoholic, but didn't want to let people know that. So he created a funny character. No, no, this was just (laughs) him. So I'm just going to, you know, let's see if there's, you know, a deli or something, you know, around to, you know, get something to drink and a snack. You know, um, Uh he had, yeah. So (laughs) if you could see this. No, no. I can. And uh, (laughs) it's not funny. Don't even. Uh, okay, so we have a, sec- uh, a, a, a segment on oh. the show. Are there questions and I answer them? Yeah, it, oh, uh, okay. it's, but it, they're called famous questions. Oh. Yeah. Uh, be- Kevin Pollack. Because they are written by famous uh, friends and or famous former co-workers. Oh, shit. Yeah. Uh, so we're going to go to the aforementioned Sam Levine. Ah, Sam Levine. Yeah. Uh, by way of including him in today's uh, broadcast, uh, and and this question is written to – they're all written to you specifically by these people. And uh, <laughs> this one really does bring home the, uh, the extraordinary uh, sense of humor that is Sam Levine. Our mutual co-star, Bizu Phillips, yep. has one of the most frequently misspelled last names – Give it a shot. 
P H I L L I. No. P H I L I P P S. Correct. Thank you very much. You saved it just in time. I knew there was a double something that shouldn't be a double. Yeah. Yeah. So the non double L and mm -hmm. the double P. Right. He's got a follow up question. Ooh, Jesus Christ. Sam. How influential do you feel your role in the film Rookie of the Year was on the <laughs> Cubs finally winning the World Series? Um, I take full credit for that. Uh, yeah. I brought That's correct a, uh, a, a one line scene, a one line part. Mm -hmm. uh, and I added so much physical crap to it that. Um, uh, the director, Daniel Stern. Danny Stern. Danny I'm, Stern. I'm just going to say it. Also a former guest of the show. Oh, jeez. Wow. <laughs> I, I'm very – I'm happy I'm here. This is great. Who canceled? Um, Larry Stern. <laughs> <laughs> um, One line, Danny Stern. Yeah. So, you know, and and my scene is with, with Danny Stern. And so uh, we – you know, he lets me kind of just go off. Yeah. And um, – I think th that made the movie a tremendous hit. Yes. And uh, therefore- uh, He let you improvise. Life. Yes. Uh, well, not really. I had that one line, uh, but he let me kind of choose a character, which was broader than it needed to be. I see. And um, and I think that, that made Chicago come together as a town because they were pretty separate. And then it only took- 24 more years right. before the, the Cubs won the World Series. Right, but they held on to that performance, Yeah, oh, waiting yes. for they, all the, the ducks to line up. Yep. yep. They're like, let's do that for that bellhop. Mm -hmm. uh, speaking of uh, former co-stars, like the Bizu Phillips. Uh, <laughs> it's just busy. It's uh, all right. B it's B-U-S-Y. No, I don't think so. It is. Josh Hopkins. Yeah. Yeah. Has also, he been on the show? Also a fella no, that, that you been. worked with on, yes. uh, on the Cougar Town. He's a wonderful, wonderful man. He certainly is. Yeah. He has three questions for you. Oh, really? Yep. First one, what's your fucking problem? <laughs> That's, you, bitch. Yep. Okay. Correct answer. Thank you. Question number two, have you ever been sober on screen? <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, yes. Not on that show. Nope. Not on, not on uh, oh, man. Uh, they learned after uh, a few years that if they gave me a lot of things to say after lunch, they mm -hmm. weren't going to get what they wanted. I see. Yeah. Because lunch was fun time. Lunch was, was fun time. It was a relaxing time. Yeah. And sometimes before I got to work was a little bit fun right. on the drive. Sure. Uh, but I wasn't drinking. I no. don't drink and drive. No, no. Please. Not at the same time. No. Third question. Yes. What has your daughter taught you that's made you a better person and better actor? Oh. Uh-huh. How to lie. Sure. Um, and uh, how actually, exactly did well, she teach you how? <laughs> because she, she, wants she wants questions answered, and I don't want to give her the right answer, and sometimes I have to make it up. Uh, or I don't know what it is. It's, it's interesting that you, you uh, studied and performed improv all those years, <laughs> and yet— I can't come up with a <laughs> – When it with, comes yes, to improvising. Can't do it with my daughter. Uh, an answer to your daughter's question. So really she 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 forces you to tell the truth. Well, you know, I, here's here's the thing. When uh, she came into our lives, we I had no idea what I was doing. And she kind of let us know what she needed. Huh. You know, she let us know that, you know, she needs this, she needs food now, she needs this and that and the other thing. And so – uh, and also, like, what emotionally she needed. So I got to – I became more present yeah. as a person yeah. because I had to be – you know, I'm – like, all of a sudden, I'm responsible for the life of this person here. And so I – you know, that helped, I guess, in, in acting where, you know, I'm actually listening to the person who's talking. Yeah. Which was it's all for you, me yeah. because I was just about me. Yeah. Yeah. It's – it's uh it's interesting because improv, I would think, also teaches – I never took a class of the improv – to listen. Yes. Right? And be present. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, you you gave that up <laughs> until your daughter came into your life. No, I had that. But, I, you know, it's things you, you do, but then it's – This business forces you. It forces you to, to do that and also – and so I realized that there was there – was, 
there was an area where I was not fully doing what I should be doing on state or screen or whatever it is. Mm-hmm. And uh, being present, being as present as I sh- could be, and sober. Well, yeah, as you could be, as I could be. Right. It's so hard. <laughs> Well, uh, I mean, it's everywhere. Yes. Alcohol is everywhere. Well, it, it's not in this room, and you seem fine. Uh-oh. Yeah, this, <laughs> this is not a water bottle. <laughs> mm. uh, your daughter is how old now? Why do you want to know? Well, she's about 12. About? She's about 12. 12. Yeah. Okay. Could you be less specific? <laughs> she's uh, uh, under 24. Okay. Um, and um, what what— did she say in the last 72 hours that surprised you? <laughs> um, you know, uh, wow. She she gives me uh, she gives me looks. Yeah, and it's the looks that make all of a sudden just make me crack up. Um, she has, you know, I don't know where she gets these looks from. Uh, <laughs> I don't know what it is. She has such a great comedy thing. I mean, she's not biologically my child, and so I have, you know. You can't take any credit. I can't take any credit for this. But, but she I, has an amazing— I uh, say nature, nurture. You need to take credit. Yeah, I guess so. Both of you. Yeah. We're, yeah. we're pretty. Yeah. She's she's observing. Yes. Uh, but she, she whips a look on me. Like, sure. you know, I'll ask her to do something, and she'll just—the opposite of what I think she's going to— Look, the expression. Right. And it just floors me. Mm. Um, but I have a crappy memory, so I can't really recall anything specific. Now, Ian, do you find any sort of possible <laughs> connection to the crappy memory and the alcohol of some uh, consumption? <laughs> it's a crutch. Jeff Garland yes. writes uh, this question for you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's a Jeff Garland. (laughs) I didn't think I had a Jeff Garland impression until he was on the show a couple weeks ago. And um, uh, all of his reactions uh, are involuntary, I realize. (laughs) He has no editor and no control over his body or thoughts. And he's not not a sarcastic bone in his body. No. None. No. Everything is painfully genuine. Yes. Or hilariously genuine. But I, I like pudding. <laughs> but I but I found myself doing the smallest, tiniest uh, comedy take. He there was a water bottle on the table, and I he was done with it. And while he was talking, I took it and put my arm out to the right uh, with nothing over under the bottle than the carpet three feet below, and I just dropped it while he was talking. Uh, that tiny little inappropriate uh-huh. gesture was enough to oh my god. <laughs> yeah, just losing his <laughs> mind. Uh, there was no <laughs> no because you you dropped it. Um, yeah, so that That's was very nice. good. That was fun. That's very good. His question is about back uh, about uh, your wonderful daughter. Your daughter is adorable. Oh, your wife, thank you, is adorable. Yes, we know no one else is that adorable. But who comes closest to adorability? Mm. I would say Jeff's wife, yep. Marla Garland. Uh, she's wonderful. She was my uh, one of my agents in Chicago. Is that right? Yeah. Uh, uh, my second agent, I had a bad agent before who stole money from me, uh, my first agent. And Whoa. then I had um, then I had Marla and uh, this woman, Kathy Baum, and she, they, they were amazing. They're, they would let me hang out in the office with them, so warm and friendly. And Marla is, is a tremendous talent as well. She's – She's a singer. Uh, she's a great actress. Um, I don't know why she went into being an agent, but um, but yeah, she's fantastic. I think she's cute as a button as well. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. I would have to agree. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, it was it was at your home mm-hmm. um, <laughs> playing uh, running shreds. Oh yes. Yeah. Yeah. That uh, Jeff and I discussed, and I I I continue to attempt to mea copa. And uh, he insists that it's forgotten and forgiven, but I know it isn't. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, yeah. Uh, I'm going to run down some titles. Okay. And uh, of films and, okay. and or television pro- yes. programs. Yes. And you all I to- ask is that it's sort of a free association, whatever comes to mind. Great. I'm not looking for Got you to it. dig up the best story ever. Okay. Just whatever comes to mind. Okay. 
uh, this appears to be an early, if not first, uh, foray into film called Excessive Force. Excessive Force with Thomas Ian Griffith? Griffin. It's not a test. Okay. Um, that was uh, – we shot that in Chicago and then they had a reshoot uh, here in Los Angeles and I got to come here basically for the first time. Um, how, does, and it was, how does this come your way? Uh, there's, you know, it's an audition thing and it was to play the, uh, the nerd – scared a uh, stenographer while uh, Thomas Ian Griffin Griffith is uh, using excessive force to uh, get a confession out of uh, somebody he just beat up. So he, they're in the hospital room. So I'm in the corner going, yeah, okay, yeah, I got that, you know, and then- Was that uh, the voice you used? That was basically, yeah. Okay. I don't think I had any lines. Cody, would you uh, mind maybe, looking maybe. up uh, excessive force to see if it was uh, Griffith or Griffin? Just because I don't want to keep uh, salting this person. Uh, he's a very, very nice man. Yeah, Thomas it's Ian too Griffith. late for that. Thomas so Ian Griffith. So Griffith. you get cast in this thing and you're doing, you're casting it. Yeah. You're doing and, the wacky voice, which and they do, allow. W yes, and, uh, you know, and it was- uh, yeah, I, I had great fun, and I got to come here and uh, spend some more time. Was well, that your first? My first time. Griffith. Griffith, Griffith is Griffith. the correct answer. Griffith. It was my second Thank time you, here. Cody. I was here as a child visiting uh, my step-parents, stepfather's family. But it was the first time on the set of a film? I think As an actor? Let's go with yes. Yeah, yes. And, uh, and, and how is that? Because I find those early experiences where you know nothing. Like, you Absolutely. don't even know— what craft service is? Nothing. And, and I, I'm. I'm. Uh, is there any? Is there any food? <laughs> you remember asking, and then someone would take you to a table or seven, right? Yes. depending on the budget, and you cannot believe. Right. You've never seen food. Well, I, I'd like worked this. in commercials. I'd done commercials uh -huh. before, and so I knew kind of what to do. You know, around the set etiquette, kind of a little bit. Uh, um, but it was. Yeah, I'm going to need to know about these commercials because I was, I, you know, local commercials, regional, regional, national. Yes, I did. I did one great national commercial for Bud Light. That's correct. And it was, the, <laughs> and it was with um, uh, Eddie uh, Cantor, <laughs> Ben Halen, <laughs> and Moshe Diane. Uh -huh. um, uh, I'll, I'll think of his name. I'm sorry, Eddie um, Griffith. No. Yep. Eddie Griffin, that's someone else. Oh. Uh, anyway, it was the uh, I played a limo driver, and he's the guy who's trying to get you know a free uh, some free Bud Light, and he's like, uh, "Hey, limo uh, driver, do you have Bud Light in your your uh, your limo?" And he's, I say yes, and he goes, "Well, then I'm Doctor, and my, the name I'm holding in my placard is like it's like an eye chart. It's like gla 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 gla, and he's like." Galawikic, and I'm like, you mean Dr. Galakowicz? And he goes, yes, I am. And that thing took off and, you know, became, on radio shows they were having, sound like this guy, the yes, I am guy, and you'll win, you know, 100 bucks or something like that. So um, that money that I made uh, brought us out to California. Wow. Yeah. That's uh, kind of a big deal. That was a big deal. At the time. <clears throat> yes. Can was. I give you a little uh, <clears throat> writer's punch up on the story? <laughs> yes. Which you do often. When you uh, I'm, I'm when you share this here. next. Yes. Okay. And I encourage you to do so. It's a charming tale. Uh, start with the fact that you're a limo driver at an airport with a sign in your hands. I was I was trying to rush because I pictured it. you yes. in the car. He's okay. in the back. All right. Do you have any Budweiser while okay. he's sitting in the back seat? Yes. Okay. So uh, you were you were quite familiar with craft service. Is the point by the time you got to uh, Mr. Griffith's yes, film Excess of Force? Excessive Force. Okay. Any Gary Busey stories from Rookie of the Year? He always ate with the kids. Now, when you say the kids, you mean the cast? The cast who were children. Yes. Because there are a bunch of children on, on the thing. And go, hey, guys, let's go sit down over here and eat our mac and cheese. You know, it was... Yeah, kind of weird like that. Uh huh. He wanted nothing to do with you. It sounds like. I mean, I, I was never going to go up to him and go, "Hey, Mr. Busey, you know, I loved you." And I couldn't think of a movie, but um, <laughs> uh, but he was just, you know, he has this air like, ah, "Don't bother me," and he just wanted to eat with the children. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's um, he's a very, very interesting character. I bet he is, and wildly entertaining. I <laughs> uh, is my assumption too. We were at a uh, party together, I think, in Malibu. I'm pouring water. When you say we, do you mean you and you him? And I. You, you and, and I. I. Sure. I think we were. We saw it at um, the guy, the Burnett 
Ah, uh, yes. yes, yes. And he was there. Mark Burnett. Yes. Yeah, he was. was. Because of The Apprentice. Then he was on The Apprentice at the That's time. That's right. And I cut uh, Gary Busey off, like, on my way to the bar or something. Oh, boy. And he was like, hey, buddy, what are you doing? And he got, <laughs> like, he went from zero to 100 <clears throat> in the really pissed off at me just for, like, you know, almost bumping into him. In a nanosecond. And it was just like, hey, yeah. And just got really Since you angry. mentioned the Mark Burnett Christmas party, mm-hmm. um, which I think we only got the invite a couple of years. We got it once. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I think I exaggerated by 100%. We got invited once. Um, <clears throat> no, I think it was two because I was doing a, a thing for him. And so uh, the most eclectic... You know, you hear about these Hollywood parties, and we've all been to parties in the Hollywood area, mm-hmm. and uh, with famous people in them, a game night at your house, what have you. But um, it's rare that, um, you know, you look around a room at a Christmas party, and there's Barbra Streisand, Arsenio Hall, uh, Pierce Brosnan. Gene Simmons. Uh, Gene Simmons, <laughs> right? It's the most eclectic, iconic, yeah. you know, uh, level of fame. Yeah. Uh, and also, what do these people have in common? Right. Mark Burnett. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and 17 uh, food stations. Yeah. Very impressive. Yes. Yeah, the, uh, the, the yeah, wow. Yeah, that was, a, that was a great party. I great think food. fake snow out front and carolers, as yeah. you uh, brought up in a golf cart. It was all very, very impressive. Mm-hmm. Um, and once. Once. Well, yeah. <laughs> I'll tell you who was not having a good time that night. Um, Miss uh, James Brolin would that be the father that's with? Oh, Babs. Now? Yes. Yeah, James Brolin did not look like. No, it, it was his idea to go to the. Party. Oh. <laughs> it did not look like when that discussion happened. Uh, he did not have much say. Uh, let's go quickly to married with children. I think that's usually how it goes in that household. Yeah. Yeah, I think with uh, with Babs and, and uh, James. James. Do you think uh, her having a, a gift shop on the property where they live was his idea? No. Nope. Yeah. Nope. Probably I not. I don't know. No. Um, married with children. I was uh, new was to Los Angeles. New to La- a Los young Angeles. Man. That was the first job I got out here mm-hmm. uh, while I was living here. I was on the 200th episode of Married with Children. You were living in what squalor? I was living in Hollywood. Uh, we were renting a condo right by Runyon Canyon Park. That's correct. <laughs> when you say we, at that point, we. I was I was married with uh, with uh, Tania. Uh huh. At the time, and. Uh, we we lived in this place, and it was you know it was a great apartment. It was one bedroom with two bathrooms. That's impressive, which was fantastic, and and uh, uh, was much easier on our lives. Now that you've mentioned the misses, oh. we have one more famous question. Okay, from Jane Lynch. Oh yeah, who asks uh, what your if you remember what your and Nia's couple nickname was at Second City. <laughs> wow. There was um, a nickname oh, yes. combining the, your name. The Neans. The Neon. Yes. I thought that was damn cool. Uh, because this is way before, uh, to my awareness, a show, right. bu- show business folk with the uh, yes, with the Brad Gelino. Co- right, stuff. exactly. We were the first. The Neans. Neon. So it's Nia and Ian. Sure. Nia, I'm, I'm, I know you know. I'm just spelling it out for everyone else. Uh, so you're, you're living in, um, and you, and your 200th episode, but this is your first gig in LA. First gig in LA. Kind of a big fucking deal. Really big deal. Yeah. But not for everyone else because it's their 200th episode and no one really cares that I'm there. So you, you arrive to complete boredom on, uh, yeah. on set. Yes. Everyone's I, had it. Yeah. They and were over it. I think I had one line maybe and, uh, I was pretty scared. Yeah, I was I was nervous. Live Very in front nervous. of a studio audience. Yes, exactly. And Had you, you know, done that, that before? N- uh, n- well, not recording like That's that. What, no, yeah, a sitcom. Um, and uh, you know, it's you know how a sitcom goes. You rehearse it all week, and it gets less and less funny because you know you start doubting yourself, and they're not laughing as much mm-hmm. uh, because they've heard it so many times before. And then by you know by the time you shoot it, it's old. I mean, to to me, it was, and uh, it was just one line or something, and I was just really nervous about the whole thing. And but you know, I didn't get fired, which you know ha- happens. happened, which happens, yeah, yeah. 
like after a table read or the first rehearsal. During the table read During sometimes. <laughs> someone will tap you on the shoulder and say, hey, can you come with me? Yeah, we just we, there's a fitting. And then you follow them and they say, there's no fitting. There's no fitting. Uh, you need to go to your car and drive away. Uh, All of a sudden you're Joe Pesci. Ah, oh, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, getting shot in the back of the head. The two in the back of the coconut. Uh, well, let's segue, if we may, from Married with Children to Melrose Place. Because for you, that's got to be like a dream come true. That I don't remember at all. <laughs> I, re I was on that show. I remember some guy pushing me up against the wall, like in the scene, pushing me up against the wall and uh, with his hand around my throat. Sure. And that's all I remember. I mean, it was like in and out. I'm right. glad it's on my, my resume because everyone knows Melrose Place. I mean, people of a certain age. Um, but it was really not a big thing. Is that when the drinking while working started? Yeah. Probably. Yes. Uh, we were both directed by Ron Howard. Yes. Uh, in your case, Ed TV. Yes. What was that experience? Like? Well, the uh, the audition was fantastic because I, uh, I, was, I knew – I was told that I was going to go have a meeting with Ron Howard. And How about go that? sit that? And I was like, wow, this, this is, is fantastic. And um, so I go, okay, don't make any Opie references. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. Mm -hmm. So I, uh, I go in and I'm being very careful. And at the time I was working on the Drew Carey show. Yes, you were. And uh, Drew's uh, mother on the show was Marion Ross, who played uh, – Ron Howard's mother on Happy Days. Mm. So I I go in and we're talking, chit chatting, and then and that, and uh, he says, "Oh, you're on Drew Carey show and over at Warner Brothers." You know my mom, and I go, "Yeah, your mom plays Drew's mom." Oh no! And but his mom was like in the accounting department over at Warner Brothers. He meant his actual mother. Yes, yeah. his actual mother. Yeah, because he said my mom. He said my mom, and I and I jumped at like ah, I I get the reference, and I I made an ass of myself, but I still got the job, and um and I got to watch a lot of people work, which is great. Uh, Matthew McConaughey and um, uh, what's his name? Uh, <laughs> Rob Reiner. What's his name? Rob Reiner. Mm -hmm. Um, and Ellen DeGeneres, and uh, I, I had a great time. Yeah, it was good. I didn't get to do much. Donnie Most. Uh, from a Happy lovely Days. man, a very nice man, uh, terrific talent. Yeah, Ron Howard. I, I, um, I think there's a moment in The Grinch where Jim Carrey, as the Grinch, there was a famous moment where he says, um, "Cut, print, whatever, moving on." You know that whole thing. And I, I know he was uh, imitating Ron uh, in that. The, in my experience, was a lot of that was great. That was great. Uh, let's do it again. There's a lot of. <laughs> <laughs> Super positive encouragement, yes. but let's do it again. Yes. Which indicates maybe it didn't go to your liking. But you would never know from all no. the positive feedback. No, very positive person. So, so I found myself confused. We're going to do it again, but I'm not I'm, – I don't know what I should do differently. Uh, I loved working with him. But I did fall prey to the moment when he stepped outside the soundstage – to, um, I don't know, let's just say make a phone call. But that sounds uh, less like Ron. So he, he had to leave the soundstage for a very important reason. And while he was gone, <laughs> to I, write a letter to I asked, that's daughter. right, yes. to, to the front lines. Uh, I asked the entire crew when Ron came back on the soundstage for everyone to whistle uh, the theme from Andy and Mayberry. Uh, yeah, and that was fun. Wow. Yeah. Uh, and and he, he how did he react? He laughed and was embarrassed, <laughs> and then I felt horrible from his embarrassment. Right? Yeah. That was not what I was looking for. No, no. Um, what were you looking for? I was looking for being fired. I was tired <laughs> of working. I needed to be out of the business forever. Uh, do you do you remember anything? Because now I have to preface every yeah, question that this me. way. From working with – or any scenes with Lindsay Lohan while shooting a film called Get a Clue. Get a Clue. That was shot up in uh, Toronto. That's right. I was there for a while. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, she was – I mean, she was what? Like uh, like 14 at the time or 13, 14? She was, she was very young. So she wasn't the Lindsay Lohan we knew, we know. Um, she was uh, delightful. She was, she was – she, yeah, but you could see that, you know, uh -oh. she's kind of digging her, you know – 
her celebrity status a bit. Starting to enjoy it. Yeah. But she it's was... an odd thing to see on a child mm-hmm. uh, when they turn. Yeah. Or um, sometimes it can be, oh, they're having fun. But she was very nice. And, and I got to say, I saw her years later and she remembered me. And I wasn't like, I didn't work with her that much, but she remembered me. And How many years later? Uh, I'd say- Like a good while? S- like six, seven years later. Oh, so she was- Six, yeah. Super successful yet. Yeah. Maybe it wasn't six or seven. It was, it was five years. Ah. Maybe, yeah. And yeah. She, and she was very nice. I mean, you know, mm-hmm. I really don't have uh, much negative things to say about her. Oh, we're not uh, looking for negative. Okay, good. In fact, I was looking for positive. Yeah, she's very, yeah. A delight. She was a delight. Uh, okay. And professional. Yeah. yeah. She always seemed like oh, shenanigans came her way. Some she created, some she couldn't avoid. But that she was like an old school, old pro. Yeah. At uh, the actual doing of the job. Yeah, she was. Yeah, that's good to oh. hear. Um, I, w- I need to hear more about Supergirl. Okay. So this is a, a recent. Yes. Within so, the last couple of years. Yes. So what happened was uh, Supergirl, uh, the show was on CBS, and then they got picked up for a second season. But uh, I guess there was some licensing thing or whatever it was, and then they moved it from CBS to uh, the CW mm-hmm. and from Los Angeles to Vancouver. Oh, boy. So when that happened, I think, and I don't know this, this is all speculation, I think Calissa Flockhart said, I don't want to live in Vancouver. I have a life down here. I don't really need to do this show. I'll do a few of them and then see you later. Um, so they needed a new kind of asshole boss for her. And so I auditioned for uh, this guy, Snapper Carr, who if you know, you're know a DC fan, there was a character, Snapper Carr, mm-hmm. who was a reporter. And, um, but I wasn't basing, on, basing my character on that character. But what were you basing it on? On uh, what the line said in mm-hmm. the script right. and uh, right. how I could maybe come up with a gruff character that didn't shave that much. Mm. And so um, I got to go – I got to spend some great time in, in Vancouver and – Great work, town. Work, great town. How much of a uh, uh, time commitment was this? Would they, you come and go? Uh, and, uh, sometimes earlier on uh, they would – because they were a little disorganized because it was new location for them and new place and new people. They would – you know, I'd be up for a week and work a day. Mm. And then it became you're up for two days and working one day. Mm. You know, so th- they kind of – they got it together. But those, you know, I was up there for a little while and sometimes, you know, have a few days off and just go around and it's fantastic. I, I love that city. Yeah. You found some military people. I found some military people. And had a barbecue. People. And a barbecue. Right. Um, it was great. They were very – they and they buried a pig and cooked it. Yeah. Yeah, which is weird. Much better in Vancouver. Yes, much better. Um there's a restaurant there the next time you uh, find yourself in Vancouver yes. called Chipino's. I think I went there. Yeah. It's crazy, amazing uh, Italian with a – there's like a, a, a glass encased uh, private dining area, but it's got this vault of wines and it's extraordinary. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think I went there because I always look on Yelp like uh, we're great restaurants and they never have the really great restaurants like – I don't know. I couldn't find them. And then all of a sudden I met like a local and he's like, oh, you got to go this place, this place, and this yeah. place. And then all of a sudden it's like, I'm having this amazing food. It's wonderful. You do have to ask the local. Yes, you do. It is interesting about the Yelp. Sometimes it'll say, restaurants near me. And, oh, Arby's. That's good. <laughs> That's good to know. There's an Arby's nearby. Five stars from mm-hmm. 4,000 people. That's <laughs> yeah. Wild. How did that happen? Um, uh that's okay, this is, this, is an, okay. Uh, this is another segment on the show. Oh, yeah. All right. It's Great. called uh, Questions for Kevin. Oh. So this is an opportunity to flip the, uh, the situation. Okay. Uh, with no research whatsoever. None. And it can be from any way, shape, or form you wish to ask them. Okay. Um, uh, I'm a questions fan of- for oh. Kevin Hart. <laughs> I probably should have pointed that out. I should have qualified a little better. I should, the setup should have been more clear. I'm not, I'm not in, the, in a limo. I'm at the airport with right. a sign oh, that says okay. yes. Kevin Hart. All right. Um, uh, on this trip that we were recently on yes. uh, for the charity. Um, Big for the kids mm-hmm. For the kids. It's all for the kids. Kansas City. Um, you had mentioned that uh, on The Usual Suspects that there was a lot of improv. I and see. That, that they uh, – 
that some of your lines got in. Was there anything that uh, – w- first of all, could you give us uh, maybe one of the most famous lines that we would know from that movie that you came up with? Uh, I'm sorry. We're out of time. <laughs> <laughs> During the interrogation – when the famously great line, um, I'm asked, you know what you do if you if you uh, get another turn in county or something, mm-hmm. you know, if I throw you back in, and then the brilliantly written line, uh, "fuck your father in the shower, then have a snack," <laughs> is the button. But prior to that, during that interrogation, he says, "You know, I can put you in Queens on the day of the, uh, on the robbery," and everything I say in that section. Uh, I live in Queens, Einstein. What do you got? A team of monkeys working around the clock on this? <laughs> so that part, uh, yeah. Uh, th- there, there are probably a half dozen. Was there something that you wish was in that didn't make it? No, they were pretty accepting. You know, this is a uh, still arguably the best script I've ever read. It went yeah. on to win an Academy Award, but there was they were open to. I mean, I wasn't trying to change the dialogue on a regular basis. I think that yeah. That helps. Okay. <laughs> Don't force shit Don't down their throat <laughs> on a daily basis. This thing you wrote is bad. I'm going to come up with something else. Yeah, but you know, like when I, uh, we're all arrested, each one of the suspects are yeah. arrested in the individual scene. So my character's in a garage and he's working on a car and there were no lines written. Just six cops come in behind me through the garage door and I just sort of give up. And so I added – You sure you brought enough guys? Yes. Because six guys came through the garage door and it's just me and I'm unarmed. So so that made the cut. I remember, yes. That was very funny. Um, Also, uh, on this trip, uh, Big Slick that we were both on, and uh, you do it often. uh, I'm sorry if I must get this guy's name wrong. uh, Edwards, uh, Ron Edwards. The comedian is it Ron Edwards? Oh, Jim Ed- Edwards. Jim Edwards. Yeah, you do a baseball bit that oh, he does, my. an announcer of him, uh, announcer a bit that he does, uh-huh. um, and you do it very well. Would you ever on stage do somebody else's stuff, credit giving them credit for it, hmm. but like saying this is a great bit that I love to do, you know, or a great bit that someone else did? I mean, it sounds like it would be a bad thing to do, mm-hmm. but you do it very well. And I'm, I'm wondering if, if that's accepted or, and if it's accepted, would you do it? Or do you feel it's like I have my own material? That is a good question. Um, there is a, a, uh, unspoken code among, uh, standup comedians that doesn't exist for, uh, writers and almost in any other genre I found. In fact, uh, Chris McCrory, the guy that wrote The Suspects, when I was asking him about one particular piece, he said, yeah, that was lifted from this. And as a comedian, I said, why, how could you do that? How could yeah. you? He said, well, what do you mean? <laughs> That's what writers do. We live from each other. But comedians don't. And so even if I were on stage and gave credit, this next thing I'm going to do is written by a friend of mine named Jim Edwards, who is uh, a, a wonderful uh, comedian who has given me permission to perform it because he's even insisted that I do it now better than him. That sort of setup uh, would be acceptable mm-hmm. if I, in fact, had a conversation with Jim Edwards and right. say, here's what I'd like to do. And he said, sure, that's fine. I can't fathom him saying, sure, that's fine, <laughs> because I'm being paid to do an hour right. on stage. Yeah. And uh, nine minutes of that hour is going to be devoted to someone else's material. Yeah. Mm. I, I, it's an interesting question, though, because yet, yet we, we do – there is a sense of pride that everything I say on stage, um, I thunk up, right, and evolve through the course of performing it many times. Mm-hmm. In the past days and to present, this happened, I think, recently with Amy Schumer. You, you can't, you are, we are allowed to hire writers to write for us, who mm-hmm. can, who found a way to write for our voice. Uh, in her case, I think it, it had something to do with uh, someone wrote. Uh, something for her that she was that she performed and was then uh, accused of plagiarism. Oh, uh, so uh, be that as it may. Uh, I, I when I ha- when I did a, a HBO special, I had a couple of writers that I brought in, and we but we mostly worked on stuff other than the stand up, some backstage shenanigans. Um, do you remember Madonna's Truth or Dare mm-hmm. movie? Yes. Where her concert is in color and then backstage is a black and white documentary. Yeah. So 
when I was doing the HBO special, David Steinberg, the great comedian yeah. and, and TV director. Very nice man. Uh, while we were working on sketches, he said, you know what you got? You know, Kevin. <laughs> he said, you guys have to. That's actually Marty Short doing David Steinberg. Uh, you guys should should pimp the Truth or Dare movie that just came out um, where you do a black and white mockumentary backstage. And it was kind of Larry Sanders before uh, in the sense that my character was was um, egomaniacal backstage. Uh, like in her movie backstage, she has a circle prayer with her dancers. Before, mm-hmm. And it's, you know, it's a black and white handheld. It looks very gritty. And you feel like you're in on something that you wouldn't normally have access to. Yeah. It looks very amazing. So I had a circle prayer with my stage hands and whatnot before I go on stage. And my character was such that I fired someone during the circle <laughs> prayer. He was that prick. So I have benefited greatly from working with writers, and I probably should on, on more more more, uh, more opportunities. All right. So yeah. One more question. Last question. Last question. Um, you uh, you've been in, you're an actor. You're uh, stand up. Mm. Uh, you you direct. Mm-hmm. Uh, you've you know had your own specials, uh, game shows, everything. What what is what is the thing you want to do that you are having trouble getting there? Huh. Well, um, I did the kind of diversify very early uh, from stand-up with fantasy of acting, but also uh, trying to develop projects and mm-hmm. produce and, and, and write. I was – you probably know this feeling. You're, you're, we're, you and I are like fifth man on a sitcom, right? Yeah. So the first one I got, uh, I pitched an idea to the showrunner for a like C story of the script. Uh, of the that particular episode. And he said, that's a great idea. Do you want to write the episode? And without blinking, uh, a thing went off in my head that allowed me to say the words, yes, yes, I would, <laughs> having never <laughs> thought that, about that. It was not behind any of the reason I pitched him the idea. I just wanted my character to have something to do on the show. So he said, do you want to write this? And I also didn't realize, because I was so new, that sitcoms are written by committee and there's a writer's room and – they took my idea and my script that I wrote into that writer's room and stripped it down and rebuilt it within an inch of its life. And uh, the storyline stayed the same. And two jokes made the final thing out of, you know, 74. Um, but I got the on-screen credit. This is 1987. I now realize 30 years ago. So I was able to join the Writers Guild. So there was always this idea of diversifying and getting things. So. Over time, constantly spinning all these plates, um, I realized I I had not done myself any favors um, in terms of stand-up because um, I started there, continued to do it, but my focus drifted quickly to acting and writing and doing all these other things. And so without ever being on a famous uh, comedy show – that would put me out there in a comedy way, I weirdly became this dramatic actor from Suspects and A Few Good Men, Casino and these things. So it was, it was never the plan, uh, never a fantasy to be a dramatic actor. You know, I think maybe you had the, a similar thing. You saw Michael Keaton in Night Shift and you thought, there you go. Let's do that. Yeah. There's a fantasy. Mm-hmm. I want to be that guy. Yeah. Um, and and so that weird thing happened. So for me, to, uh, what is the thing that I wish could happen was that I would that I would have more comedy opportunities. It is a weird, bizarre, care for what you wish yeah. uh, thing. In fact, on the whole nine yards, as the story goes, um, I was pitched to the director Jonathan Lynn. My, did my cousin Vinny other movies? Mm-hmm. British guy. I was pitched to him to play this character, Yanni Gogolak, by the stars of the movie, Matthew Perry and Bruce Willis, who I knew from previous things. And as the story was told to me, they pitched me and Jonathan Lynn said, well, right, well, I, 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 I get it. I mean, he's, good. he's a good actor. You know, I've seen The Few Good Men, seen Usual Suspects. He's very diverse, but – Fellas, this is a comedy. <laughs> now, I had been doing stand-up for 20 years at that point with a couple of HBO specials. And, right. But my my first long, hour-long HBO special came out within days of A Few Good Men premiering. And that uh, wonderful jettison into this acting career 
where I went from auditioning to actually getting offers overnight just because I was the actor who the audience had never heard of before. Everyone else was super famous in that movie. Right. And people were like, well, who's this guy? Um, <laughs> and which is Hollywood constantly feeding from who's this guy. That's how the machine works. So that lasted through the 90s. But um, – uh, it shat on 15 years of stand-up comedy, of growing up in a in a world like yourself, listening to comedy albums and pursuing that thing, and then rising up in a, in the stand-up scene in my hometown of San Francisco, making the move to Los Angeles, getting enough street cred to get an HBO special. You know, all those magical moments were bye bye <laughs> <laughs> within like. A week. Yeah. It was extraordinary. So weirdly, uh, <laughs> comedy opportunities. We worked together a we couple of years. We need a Kevin Pollock type. <laughs> yeah. Not Kevin Pollock. No, no, no. We need a funny Kevin. We need a Kevin, funny, funny, need a Kevin, funny Kevin. Kevin Pollock. So we worked together now a couple of years ago in a, a short-lived series for CBS called Angel from Hell. And that was the first time in a very long time that I was cast – with an offer to be on a a half hour comedy of a network show where the showrunner was a fan and just said you should be on this funny show it just it, yeah it, it is that's wild it is truly bizarre uh yeah 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 so so you kids out there uh, <laughs> don't diverse find one thing do it really well and say no to everything else <laughs> <laughs> that includes drugs yeah, that's right uh just say no uh well th thank you for participating in well, a brand new segment that was the the maiden voice oh really of ask kevin wow uh uh we end the show by uh, by doing a long uh this is an episode Interpretive three, dance? 316. Uh, no, it's an, it's an audio thing. This will draw upon your improv skills. Oh, geez. Uh, yep. But it's a fun game okay. uh, that you can play uh, at the next game night. It's called the Larry King game, and it works like this. <laughs> uh, and I actually taught Larry to do it, so it's Larry <laughs> King approved. The Larry King game asks you to conjure up that moment uh, when Larry had a show on CNN where sometimes he would look down the barrel of the camera and he would share something about himself mm. before, right before going to the phones. Right. Uh, the, Des Moines. Yeah, yeah. So, so before saying Des Moines, he would, he would look down the barrel and it was always something, you know, like King's things. You know, I, I prefer Hydrox over Oreo. <laughs> you know, it was always something that no one really needed to know. But he, he had a burning desire to share this thing. So he, here are the rules for the Larry King okay. game. You must do a bad Larry King impression. That removes all the pressure of okay. having to do a good one. All right. A bad Larry King makes me laugh harder. So rule number one, need a bad Larry King impression. Uh, 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 number two. Share something about Larry as Larry. So don't confuse that this is something about Ian. Okay. This is Larry talking about whatever. Okay. Uh, the less meaningful, the better. And then the third thing is go to the actually go to the phones. And if the name of the city is funny sounding, it's not a bad thing. So take a moment or two to collect oh your thoughts. Goodness. Okay, uh, it's a, a strictly uh, improvised, from, improvised from the years of training in <laughs> Chicago. <laughs> No pressure. Long left behind. Whatsoever. Here now, the Larry King game. All right. I'm buying a lamp, and I decide that I'm going to go with an oval shade. I am not a fan of triangular shades. Springfield, you're on. <laughs> that is how you play the Larry King game, ladies and Jews. <laughs> it is just that simple. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Kevin. I, I'm, um, this is a conversation. I was, I was, I was surprised. A couple and, people uh, having a conversation. Yes, I was surprised you asked me. Uh, Long time desire. Again, but thank you very much. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm very happy uh, I'm, I'm here. Uh, this was a lot of fun. You'll have to come back when uh, Larry and Sam are present so we can get the whole gaggle together. Oh, my goodness. Um, thank you. Sam. Uh, yeah, Sam yep. Levine. Uh, he's been in my pocket this entire time. <laughs> uh, I want to thank Cody, everyone's favorite engineer. Yay, Cody. Uh, sorry about Studio B. Uh, folks will have to write in to find out what that means. Write to us at kpcsfanmail at gmail.com. Uh, that is our show for today. I'll thank uh, Corey Levin, our uh, post-production uh, genius. And um, until next time, and as always, get out of my face. <laughs>